Welcome to this meeting of Assembly Committee for Education for the 2023 uh, legislative session. Secretary, will you please call roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Present. Assemblywoman Hansen. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Torres. Here. Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Please mark Assemblywoman Hansen excused. I believe she will be joining us um, after her meeting. Um, we do have a quorum. So welcome to the audience in Carson City. Nice to see you again. For those joining by video conference in Las Vegas, I don't see any yet, but we never know. And those listening or watching over the internet, please make sure you silence your devices. I'm doing the same. If you wish to testify, please sign in the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and any affiliation that you have for the record. Then turn the microphone off um, after you're done speaking. We do ask that you give 20 copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should be submitted to the committee manager by 1.30 p.m. yesterday. Uh, so we have it 24 hours in advance. Um, we expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during this meeting. And please note that our committee members may be uh, looking at their laptops or devices during um, the meeting. Don't take this as um, any sort of form of disrespect. It's just where we have our documents. Um, we've also been asked to um, reiterate the fact that um, if you do have a presentation, don't put any photos in there unless you own those photos and have a clear copyright to them or logos. So just pr keep it clean so we don't have any issues uh, going forward about what we can upload to Nellis because we want everyone to be able to see what we can see. Um, just so there's lots of transparency and daylight and not any sort of uh, appearance of anything that um, is not above board. So today we're going to hear two bills. So exciting stuff for Assembly Education, Assembly Bill 42 and Assembly Bill 54. Um, I will open the hearing on AB 42. This measure revises provisions relating to class sizes. To present this measure, we have Joan Ebert, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and Megan Peterson, Deputy Superintendent, Student Investment. And please go ahead and when ready, are you going to start with amendments? Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Bill Bray Axelrod, Vice Chair Taylor, members of the committee. Uh, we were going to go ahead and incorporate the amendments uh, to what we're presenting today uh, instead of treating them as separate. Would you prefer we treat them separate? No, that is fine. Just um, I want everyone to know, um, and this especially for the folks who are watching online, um, that you w might pull up the bill, but you want to make sure you pull up that amendment too because it, it, they're going hand in hand. It is uh, what we refer to as a friendly amendment because it was made from the department that is bringing the bill. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, State Superintendent Joan Ebert, for the record, we are presenting Assembly Bill 42 to you this morning. The Nevada Department of Education, as noted, submitted a friendly amendment to, and I'll be speaking to it as amended. So our studies on class size in the state of Nevada have been going on since 1979. With class size legislation first introduced in Nevada in 1989, over the last 34 years, Nevada has iterated multiple policies related to class size reduction, and AB 42 speaks to respond to the changing face of our state. AB 42 expands class size reduction to include charter school and university schools for the family gifted for reporting purposes. 
Reporting has historically applied only to school districts. However, over time, we've seen rapid growth within our charter schools. They currently have about 12.5% of our students within our state. If you add the additional 2.5 uh, charter school students that are authorized uh, with individual school districts, that makes up about 15% of our student population at this point in time. And so with that trend, the increase in enrollment, we want to make sure that we capture the data on class sizes within all of those schools, um, as well as our public schools. AB 42 seeks to center high quality data collection to support future policy and utilize the class size reduction reporting by ensuring that the data sets are holistic, meaningful, and representative of our state. As heard from school districts and discussed by the st at the State Board of Education, class size reduction is regu regularly a source of frustration as ratios are difficult to meet with educator shortages, funding limitations, and restrictions related to the ability to build new skill school buildings and add classrooms in our rural areas. So section seven, as amended, as the chair noted, continues the use of alternative pupil ratios for school districts who pop, whose population are less than 100,000 students. To align with research and current trends in state education policy across the United States while responding to school district um, notes, as I noted earlier, Nevada's current cl class size ratios um, continue to be a challenge. And we want to make sure that when this reporting transpires, that we are taking action on the data. The state superintendent of public instruction in the law does have the authority uh, for sanctions and other um, pieces, as well as the state board of education. And so by normalizing and looking at the data differently, um, looking at the class size ratios in reporting from what currently is to the ones that we are recommending and also adding in English language arts and mathematics. Uh, we believe that we'll have a clearer picture of what is transpiring across our state. We also know, uh, looking forward to the education funding, that all of those pieces that contribute to the uh, ratios that we have, we'll be able to see a decrease and then truly support uh, school districts in moving forward for um, having lower class sizes. The ratios for English language arts and mathematics, we're looking at 25 to one for grades four through six reporting, as well as 30 to one for grades seven through 12. Those are reports that we haven't asked for in the past, and so those would be new to the State Department of Education and available to the public. Finally, AB 42 proposes that districts and schools submit their class size ratio and var variance request reports twice a year rather than every quarter. This will reduce the reporting burden by 50%, obviously, um, without reducing the value of the data collected. Additionally, Section 5, as amended, requires the names of the schools within the school district, charter school, university school for profoundly gifted pupils that are requesting the class size variance. Thank you, and we stand ready to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much. I will first go to Assemblywoman Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, so I'm just going through it. I'm just trying. Uh, so I have a couple questions first about the 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 process for the variants uh, because I don't know that. I've been briefed any time recently on what that looks like. So can you one kind of just describe what that variance process looks like and then like also explain whether or not the NDE has ever denied a variance and what that would look like, why it might be denied and why they're approved? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Torres. For the record, State Superintendent Joan Ebert. Um, so to your question in the reports, currently they're submitted four times a year uh, to the State Board of Education. Uh, the State Board of Education does have it as an agenda item uh, four times a year. As the time since I have uh, been in the department, which is nearly four years, as well as prior reports, I do not believe that the State Board of Education has ever taken action on variances that go above the recommended uh, class size. 
now to, to the why and what could they do. Uh, again, speaking to the time that I've been here, we had the pandemic for one. It was very difficult to look at um, class sizes and what was transpiring in our schools when uh, students were either every other day or they weren't um, in session. Um, also, too, knowing the uh, teacher educator crisis that we've had um, most recently and continuing, um, the State Board has looked at how do we first support school districts in making sure uh, that they have the resources that they need to drive those class sizes down. Um, I think with the uh, funding that is coming in this legislative session um, that you all will be voting on, uh, those types of reasonings, because there's four reasons why they may um, place on the report. It is funding is one. They do not have the funding to support the staffing. They do not have a qualified teacher. The, the classroom facilities, they don't have enough space within the school building, which we've seen over time. Our school districts um, have grown rapidly in some parts of the state. And then other they may list. And so those are the four reasons that they list. Um, again, I would point to we're moving in the right direction with uh, funding for education, the strategies that we're using for retention and recruitment of educators. So uh, the State Board and the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, myself, look forward to really digging in on these reports and um, taking action on where we can support school districts. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and so I guess I, uh, I guess like, has there, I, I don't remember when this law went into effect, I'm, uh, if legal counsel could help me find that, but if you could, uh, like, if you could explain then, like, if though a school was denied, like, what supports has NDE provided historically to schools so that it doesn't happen? Because I think we know the reason class sizes are large, right? I mean, I think it's those three indicators, right? It's a lack of funding. It's the number of teachers. We don't have enough licensed professionals available. Uh, it's a, a lack of facilities. So, like, we know that those are the issues. So, whether or not I send you the report or not, we know that those are the three reasons why we don't have, um, why we, our class sizes are so large. So, I'm just, like, wondering what supports NDE is providing like has there been a time where the NDE is seeing like oh okay like this school district has thousands in some cases thousands of class sizes that are significantly larger than they should be um, and so these are the supports we're providing because I, I feel like this is just almost creating unnecessary reporting for schools without like actually providing the support necessary like teeth for them for there to actually be smaller class sizes. Thank you for the question. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, uh, those components that I noted, especially the teacher pipeline we've been involved in, um, I will tell you we not, have not been involved in construction projects or bonding you know, at the district level, but are definitely supportive of those um, pieces. What I would say in what types of actions in the future that the uh, State Board of Education uh, may take is looking, drilling in specifically at those numbers, looking at how zoning is done within a school district, um, where those students are attending, all of those pieces that can contribute to uh, over class sizes that are um, larger than expected. Thank you. Um, raise your hand if you have a question just so I can get an idea, okay. Um, I'm going to go next to Assemblywoman Anderson, who I have to, she gets the gold star for uh, writing all her questions and submitting them, but um, she actually raised several good questions, and so even though we, we, I have the answer, we have the answer, but I'd like to get them on the record. So um, she, you could just confirm it and have the superintendent confirm Great. if you'd like. Okay. Well, first of all, I get to confirm the fact that I have a gold star. <laughs> so that's really the important thing. Um, so thank you so much for the quick reply. Uh, um, Ms. Broughton, you, you, I, I believe you guys replied right away to it. And I am that person that like, is like, well, what about, what about? So I greatly appreciate the amount of information that you gave me. Um, the first one has to do with Section 5, Subsection 8 of Page 7, uh, why the change to a yearly or annual report versus a quarterly. And then I just want to make sure that this is still cor correct that there is no impact on the funding formula with the change from a, a quarterly to a twice a year. Is that correct? 
Superintendent Ebert, for the record, yes, that is correct. And the main reason for the change again was? Thank you. Um, prior to the pupil-centered funding plan being put into place, we had categorical funds for class size reduction. Those categorical funds were grouped into the pupil-centered funding plan to allow school districts more flexibility. And so that categorical fund is now in the pupil-centered funding plan. Great. Um, thank you. And then the other thing is with... Um, and again, that happens again, one other area of the bill, I think it's 8.1.2B. Um, with the removal of the communication of the Board of Trustees, which I believe is on page 10, why was that decision made of um, removing the communication with the Board of Trustees for each school district with the minimum number of teachers uh, with the expectation to employ it? Um, because I, I feel like that's kind of an important thing for the school district to know what the state is expecting. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, so this information on page, page 10 is included in, my apologies, you're on page 10, I was looking at another question that you had asked, I apologize. Which I only asked are, like 15, it's I, all good. Um, I'm ready for the other answer. Oh, oh, oh good. Um, it's on page 10, let me see if I can find it as well. I believe it's on page 10 of the original bill that has to do around lines of 15, oh, wait, no. 35. 35. I'm at 35. 15 times 2 plus 5. So, yeah. Um, it has to do with lines 35.3 where it says communicate with the Board of Trustees of each school district regarding the expectation of the department. Uh, so why was the decision made to remove that language? Right. That also is with the um, categorical funds for class size reduction. That report was required, and since we d no longer have those categorical funds, we removed that report, that requirement. So if I just have one more. I think two more, actually. Excuse me. Um, and again, on that same page, there also was uh, the removal of the state board's input into reports of money uh, distributed to each school district in review of the plan. Is there any sort of report other than the pupil-centered funding plan? Um, and where would this report be sent to? Is it only to the, the Board of Education? Or would it also be sent to the legislature, um, in particular in IFC in non-legislative years? Deputy Superintendent Megan Peterson, for the record. Um, after the State Board of Education reviews these reports and approves them quarterly, they are forwarded to the Interim Finance Committee, and then annually in even-numbered years, um, there is an annual report due by November 15th, and then in odd-numbered years, we have a, a biennial report that is provided to the legislature. So just as a follow-up, just to make sure, so although it's no longer being required from this bill, it's, it's literally being removed from that report, the expectation still is that it will be reported to the to the Board of Education. It's just not going to be require a requirement. It's just going to be an expectation. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, um, we have been rep uh, providing those reports, and the way that it is written right now. We would not be required to, but we continue to provide transparency as one of our goals to make sure that everyone does have the information they need to make decisions. Thank you, and um, I, I understand that, and I I appreciate the fact that your uh, that your leadership you do that. However, if if we've got to have it in law, there's a reason why it feels like um, the last one has to do with why is the removal of this information on their website. Uh, because with this, ver it's on page 11, I believe it is um, uh, the, oh, I thought it was on, oh, there it is, and under 11B, um, or no, I, I thought I'd, I might have put that in the wrong side, but I remember that there was language about removing this information being present on the website, um, and it sounds like it's just going to be part of another area. However, if it's on the website, it should be very clearly stated. So just wondering why why the removal of the information on the website. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Ebert, for the record. This information is also in the Nevada report card, which is um, available on the internet, and so we felt that it was duplicative in nature. 
so again, a lot of the things that the department is presenting this session are to streamline, create efficiencies, but still maintain the transparency. So this information will be available. Um, it's just not in two places. Thank you, Chair. And just to verify the Nevada report card, is that legislated as well or is that under regulations? Superintendent Ebert, for the record, yes, that is legislative. We must have all that information posted annually uh, to the public. Thank you, Chair, for that much time. Thank you for uh, going above and beyond. I guess those Northern Nevada kids aren't so bad after all. <laughs> um, next, we will go to Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here to present today. So my question, uh, obviously is around class size. That's what all of this is around. But you mentioned that the pandemic played a role in why all of the variances uh, were being approved. But we know we've had the largest class sizes in the nation for some time, and that predates the pandemic. We know the State Board of Ed has never denied a variance for uh, a large class size. And so my question is, what in this bill actually guarantees that all that money that you're talking about coming to improve class size is actually going to get to the classrooms and is actually going to reduce the class sizes? Because as it looks, it seems that there's a whole lot of paperwork and a whole lot of tracking to just write down on paper that we have large class sizes. And so I'd like to know a little bit more about the enforcement. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, thank you, um, Assemblywoman uh, LaRue Hatch. If I understood the first part of your question correctly, as far as how does the State Department of Education with the uh, funding that translates to the school districts um, drives those class sizes, one of the key components of the people-centered funding plan is to create that flexibility. So initially, when the dollars flow to the school districts, those are determinations that are made locally. Um, whether it is uh, compensation, class size, all of those things that are, are decisions that school boards of trustees, the superintendent, the community weigh in on to make those um, very um, uh, difficult decisions on behalf of children. Uh, again, what I would point to is, is we are in an unprecedented moment in time. Uh, you know, having conversations that we never thought we'd have with a uh, education savings account that is 15%, completely 100% funded at this moment in the proposal. Um, we truly believe that it is everyone's intent to get to those numbers. Um, but as we know, triple F's in all of the reports and funding, the crisis that we've had with hiring, those things over time and rather quickly we see changing and uh, then the state board will come in and work with school districts as in the example that I gave earlier. So then my follow-up question is, if it is the intention of the school districts to lower class sizes, and if, as you say, the People Center funding plan is supposed to be locally based, then why do we have a statewide standard at all? Why would we not just set it as a local decision? Superintendent Ebert, for the record, the research based on what optimal class sizes are or what have been um, put in place for this legislature has asked the State Board of Education to put those numbers in place and on the record um, based on research. And so we do know that those are best practices. Uh, we also, I, I guess I'll stop there. That's, yeah, thank you. Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know whether to look this way or this way, so I'll scoot over. <laughs> Um, so you went through it a little quickly. Um, if you could just, for clarification's sake, go through um, in this bill what the proposed class sizes are, because I, I know that you added like language arts and math grades and then um, seven through 12 grades, just for everyone's clarification who may not know what they are currently. So what they are currently, what you added, and, and kind of what the differences are, if you would. Yes, thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy. So for the record, State Superintendent Joan Ebert, um, currently, as prescribed, it's in NRS 388.701. Kindergarten is 16 to 1. What is proposed is 18 to 1. 
in first grade, second grade, and third grade, excuse me, first grade and second grade, it's 16 to 1. And in third grade, it's 18, 18 to 1. What we're proposing for the variance request is 20 to 1 in 1 through 3. So grades 1, 2, and 3 all the same at 20 to 1. In uh, section 4 of the bill, page 5, where, where we're adding the new, adding additional reporting, um, is in grades 4, 5, and 6, 25 to 1, and then 7 through 12, 30 to 1. Okay, thank you. That's, that's exactly what I wanted. So we knew what, what the new ones are and where we were coming from. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Vice Chair Taylor. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Superintendent Ebert. Uh, just class sizes, I guess that's the, well, it's, just, it's the subject of the bill. So that's the subject of the questions. Um, you, you went through this a little bit for us when you did the introduction and kind of walked us through um, the bills. I, I thought I'd ask just again to, um, I'm, still, I'm still kind of stuck on why the proposed increase for a K through third. And, and, and certainly, just as you mentioned research-wise, we know research would, would tend, I would think, to have us lean the other, in the other direction in terms of, you know, for increased student achievement. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Taylor. Uh, for the record, State Superintendent Joan Ebert. This, and I appreciate the question, uh, truly. D difficult dis discussions that we've had. When we look at all of the reports that have been turned in over time, um, it can range from, you know, the, the recommended ratio is 16 to 1 in a second grade classroom. And we'll see reports that have 27. What we want to do is peel off those classrooms, if you will, that are between the 16 and 20 and keep them from um, the variance numbers and truly look at and dive deep in those numbers that are above the recommended uh, variance request, so the 20 to 1. The 16 to 1 still exists as you know, non-binding, those are, those are optimal that we'd like to get to. But what we're trying to do as um, a department is really focus in on those classrooms that are farthest away from that target as opposed to those that are currently um, closer. Follow-up, Chair, if I may? Thank you. Follow-up, because it seems to me that in, in, a, in a crunch, right, because I know sc schools all struggle with class sizes, with teacher shortages and all the many reasons, some of which you mentioned already, it seems as though that would kind of give an out, if you will, that, okay, good, Excel, we can just go to 18 then instead of 16. It seems like that would send a different message cognitively. I certainly recognize and understand and appreciate the goal for those to help those to really kind of target those whose numbers are really, really towards that high end. I just, I, I'm still having a hard time with raising the, the, the basement because that's our goal, as you said, it's still optimal. And that seems like changing that with other than that would, that's, that's our goal. But then that, then that automatically kind of makes 18 the floor, and so, as opposed to encouraging people to really shoot towards that 16. So just so you know, I have a little bit of a challenge with that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? I would also like to ask a question on that same page. Uh, and so on page five, when you talk about adding in the requirements for ELA and mathematics, uh, my question is why only English and math? If we are talking about important subjects in school, I could at, at least see maybe core subjects, right, including social studies and science. So why is it only English and math that that would apply to? Thank you for the question, Superintendent Ebert, for the record. That I would offer, as noted here, you know, this bill is presented to you as a starting point, um, and we look forward to adding any other subjects as you uh, move forward in the conversation uh, and speak with those that are in the field as well, you know, that are doing the work. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman, uh, and very much so, starting off point. <laughs> I think um, a few of us would like to, to drill down a few things. So uh, next we will go to Assemblywoman Moscow. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Superintendent. Um, out of our 17 LEAs, as well as our state public charter school authority, do any of them currently, are they under this threshold already? Superintendent Ebert, for the record, we would need to get back to you on exactly which school districts. Off the top of our head, we believe that Esmeralda is the only one that is not currently submitting um, any classrooms for variance. But we will get the specifics um, to you. Thank you, Superintendent. Actually, yeah, if you could let us know by district how many um, variants you're seeing. Um, if you're denying any of them, would like to know that that number as well and get that to our committee and I will distribute it. Okay, thank you. Other questions, committee? Okay. All right, so with that, um, we will open it up to testimony. I don't have my script, that's right, right? <laughs> so we will say uh, those of you out there who are Testifying in support. Oh, I think you guys all know how to testify at this point, but um, if you are testifying in support, you are testifying. Okay, we're going to make a little bit of a clarification. You are testifying in support of the bill with the friendly amendment. We have not addressed the second amendment that was submitted just recently on Nellis. So you can look at the one that was submitted by the Department of Education and be in support of the bill. So anyone in support? I said all that for nothing. <laughs> I don't see anyone rushing up to the table. I don't see anyone in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone line in support? Testify in support of AB 42. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in support of AB 42, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Okay. Next we will, so we, I will close uh, testimony in support and I will move to opposition. Opposition to a bill is not supporting the measure as written or opposing the measure as revised by amendment that has not been approved by the sponsor or measure. Do we have anyone in opposition? Don't see anyone here in Carson City. Anyone in Las Vegas? I don't see anyone in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone? I testify in opposition to AB. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Marie Nices, M-A-R-I-E-N-E-I-S-E-S-S. -E -E -S -S. I'm the president of the Clark County Education Association, represent, representing more than 18,000 classroom educators and other licensed professionals in the Clark County School District. I'm speaking today in opposition to Assembly Bill 42. CCSD currently has the largest class sizes in the nation make school safety and student learning a top priority, we have to understand that larger class sizes negatively impact student achievement. Larger class sizes affect a teacher's ability to meet the needs of struggling students. Class size negatively, negatively impacts at-risk students because it limits the time an educator can spend on small group instruction needed for remediation. Larger class sizes impact student safety as the classroom can become unmanageable. This is my 29th year in CCSD, and I've only worked at at-risk schools 
that have some of the highest number of teacher vacancies, which led to having class sizes well over the recommended levels. We do not think the statute should now reflect larger class sizes when we should be striving to reduce those ratios. The larger classroom has also directed ha, also has a direct impact on teacher retention. The most effective teachers are often assigned the largest class sizes as they are viewed as having a strong classroom management and students with better outcomes. This leads to teacher burnout, and it is a major cause of resignations in CCSD. Currently, school districts can apply for variances to overcrowded classrooms far beyond the currently mandated teacher ratios. In fact, we know from experience that this, is shift, this shifting of the goalposts on teacher ratios will only further embolden districts to continue overcrowding classrooms in excess of the new ratios and applying for variances. The focus should not be on reducing the number of variance requests. Instead, the focus should be on better recruiting and retaining educators, as well as developing a Nevada educator pipeline, so we can finally begin to reduce the number of students in each classroom. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the call. Anyone else, PPS, in opposition? PPS. This is, this is Lisa Guzman. I am the Assistant Executive Director for NSCA. I am not speaking as a CCSD trustee. I am speaking as a representative of the Nevada State Education Association, and I am in opposition to AB 469. The Nevada State Education Association has been the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSCA seeks amendments to AB 442 related to pupil-teacher ratios to move Nevada towards an average class size of 20 students. Common sense tells us and research confirms that the number of students in a class makes a real difference for students and educators alike. We know reducing class size has real benefits. For students, smaller class size can close the racial achievement gap, lead to earlier identification of learning disabilities, improve high school graduation rates, improve student behavior, and allow for more engagement in lessons. For educators, small class size improves educator morale as it allows for more individual and differentiated instruction, less time on paperwork and stronger classroom management as teachers become more aware of individual students' strengths or weaknesses. Smaller class size also means safer schools. This is why NSCA includes reaching average class size of 20 students in our marquee Time for 20 campaign. Another provision of Time for 20 to increase educator pay would increase the pool of qualified teachers applying for open teaching positions, which is necessary to reduce class size. While there are certainly important provisions in AB 42, including making pupil-teacher ratios applicable to charter schools NSCA disagrees with increasing the maximum ratio in grade K-3. With some of the largest class sizes in the nation, Nevada should be doing everything possible to reduce class sizes across all grade levels. Increasing ratios is movement in the wrong direction. We are also concerned that moving from quarterly to annual reporting and variances lifts pressure from both school districts and the state to do better. While most variances are related to the lack of available financial resources, frequent attention on Nevada's large class size is necessary to create the political will to increase education funding. Unfortunately, nothing in AB 42 forces school districts to, or the state to better adhere to pupil-teacher ratios. NSEA asks the committee to strike provisions raising class size ratios in grade K-3 and move from quarterly to annual reporting and variances while including a goal of reaching average class size of 20. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And if um, both of uh, the representatives from NSEA and CCA could submit your comments uh, to our committee, we would appreciate that for the record. Um, BPS, anyone else on the line? Hello, Marcos Lopez for the record, Nevada Policy Research Institute. I want to start by saying kudos for NDE for first improving the bill with their amendment. However, we must remain in opposition due to two reasons. First, the burdening of charter schools and university schools with unfunded mandates and regulations, as well as the entire concept of classroom size mandates. There is a growing research, uh, a body of research on the national level that is showing that this is the least cost effective means for improving student performance and that any gains are very small. In fact, the Leslie Ameri Center for American Progress has also noted that the most important uh, determinant for teacher quality, uh, for student gains is teacher quality, and that investing less in classroom size reduction would free up resources that could be used to recruit and retain highly effective teachers. Nevada policy agrees with this and also points out that using these funds for greater uh, teacher recruitment means that a, te a student will likely meet and see and receive instruction from a more effective teacher. Um, we encourage future hearings to consider classroom size mandates, elimination, as well as the recognition of out-of-state teaching licenses. Thank you. Thank you very much. BPS, are there any more callers in opposition? We are on opposition to Bill AB42. If you have just recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. Um, are you able to hear me? We are. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and thank you so much. This is Dora Lee Martinez. I represent the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition. We are disabled parents with non-disabled students, and we strongly oppose the AB 42, and we agree with all of the prior callers. As a parent with a disability and having increased classes as they are already, it's been a struggle to um, try and get in touch with teachers and my daughter is having a hard time getting in touch with their teacher because there's 35 students and one teacher in their high school. So please, let's do better. And thank you so much, and have a great Valentine's Day. Thank you to you as well. BPS, anyone else in opposition? Go ahead, caller. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Serena. I am uh, Serena Cardenas. My uh, daughter is a high school student here in uh, CCSD. And uh, I was doing my own research, and I found uh, that these studies, studies that found that smaller tasks correlate with better test scores. Uh, there was an, uh, they launched a STAR a project in which uh, they did uh, 79 schools were tested. And after four years, the students who had been placed in smaller classes were between two and five months ahead of their peers in larger classes, according to this report. So it is uh, mind boggling to me that our legislators would still consider any action that would further impact uh, the learning of our students with the, the outcomes that we have. Uh, our students are hurting and it is a national crisis that Clark County has been making uh, headlines and records for, for their scores. So any action that would further hurt their learning is uh, not to be taken. I strongly oppose AB 42. Thank you. Thank you very much for the call. BPS, anyone else? Good afternoon. My name is Cyrus Hojati. C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I'm enjoying the snow out here in Las Vegas. All I see this 
as a way to perpetuate a dysfunctional system. And every single measure we've done in the last several sessions, we've raised many different taxes and imposed a new one. We are finding out that the problem has not been solved or has hardly made any progress. This is nothing more, the way I see it, as an incentive to perpetuate the status quo. Now, I'd like to know why is it that other parts of the country or even the world have different typical teacher and student ratio? I'd like for us to explain that because maybe we can see what's going on with our population. And I know some of you don't want to talk about this. Now, the question is, why is it that we have a teacher shortage? What could that be? Could it be because of the pay? Could it be because we pushed mandatory vaccines on teachers? And by the way, I still want to know whether these lockdowns and passports and jab mandates and everything, have they really worked? Because it's been two and a half years or so. Okay, let's but stick to the bill, okay? Well, it does affect it. And, and uh, by the way, could it be because of the violence that's been going on? What is causing the teacher shortage? Now, I'll give you my experience. I was raised and I went to a high school, one of the highest ranking schools in South Orange County, California. And just one kid could really take down the entire classroom. They could ask questions in terms of how they are. And this is why increasing two or three students could drastically impact the entire classroom. All right, a 2% change, it can make a huge difference. So I urge you all to please vote no on this bill. And by the way, you kind of did prove my point even further. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next caller. Again, we are on opposition to AB 42. If you have just recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There, it seems there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much, BPS. And with that, I will close opposition and open up testimony in the neutral position. Is there anyone in Carson City in the neutral position? Okay, we have some folks approaching. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski here representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents, an organization that is composed of all 17 uh, superintendents. And we are in the neutral position today, uh, pending an opportunity to share the new amendment with uh, the superintendents from around the state. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, uh, Superintendent Ebert and uh, members of her staff we had a meeting with them yesterday. We feel that they listened to some of our concerns and hence an amendment today. Uh, we all want smaller class sizes, uh, but it is actually a school district, a community, and a statewide issue. So we will uh, continue to support class size reduction. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paige Barnes with the Frado Company here today on behalf of the Nevada Association of School Boards. We are also in neutral. Uh, we need a little bit of time to have our association members officially review this amendment. Thank you. Okay, in Vegas, do we have anyone in neutral? I'm not seeing anyone come up. BPS, so I'll go ahead and go to BPS. Do we have anyone on the phone in neutral? To give neutral testimony on AB 42, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. And with that, I will close the testimony in the neutral position. Um, 
Superintendent, did you want to come back up for any closing remarks or? Okay, with that, then I will close the hearing on AB 42, and I will now open the hearing on AB 54, so you do have to come back up. <laughs> this measure makes various changes relating to education. Uh, to present this bill, we have, once again, Joan Ebert, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. We have Megan Peterson, Deputy Superintendent of student investment and Dwayne Young, interim deputy superintendent of student achievement. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Bill Bray, Axelrod, Vice Chair Taylor, members of the Assembly Committee on Education. For the record, my name is Joan Ebert and I serve as the state superintendent of public instruction. Uh, as we presented AB 42, we'll also present AB 54 in the same way. Uh, when we go through the bill, we'll talk about the specific amended components. Nevada law requires the annual reporting of both pupils who are eligible for and who receive free or reduced breakfasts, which are referred to FRB or lunches, FRL. This data point has historically been used as a socioeconomic indicator in education data and as federal requirement. The Department of Education annually collects and reports pupils who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch each year on October 1st. Section 2 of AB 54 as amended eliminates the requirement to collect data around students who receive free and reduced price breakfast and lunch and to continue to collect data around those students are, that are eligible. And I've received a lot of questions in regard to, so I want to make sure to specifically clarify, um, students that are eligible, we will still continue to report. Those that are receiving over time, um, two things. Number one, uh, the students that are receiving or that are taking advantage of the opportunity to participate varies from day to day. One day, um, students, a group of students may make a determination that they will participate and receive, actually receive the meal, and the next day they may not. Um, so that is not only a personal choice that is left with the student, but the variation over time is very hard to track uh, for our school districts. So they currently track um, the those that are eligible and we will continue to track those that are eligible. The federal law in addition to that federal law does not require us to report receivers and so that is another um, reason for aligning what we currently do, or excuse me, what is current practice at the federal level with state level practice. Um, section two as amended seeks to align both the state and federal reporting requirements. And uh, for that reason, we are asking for that change in this bill. Moving on to section four, we propose a change to payments to hospitals that are providing educational services on behalf of our local school districts. Currently, the Department of Education is providing payment directly to the hospitals on behalf of school districts and charter schools. Districts and schools are not always notified when a student has transferred to a hospital education program and often districts and schools are not aware of the educational programs and instruction the student is receiving while undergoing medical care. Often there is not a transition plan and so this bill wants to, we would like to codify that there is more collaboration between the individual school district and a student that is participating in a hospital education program. Section four of AB 54 would modify NRS 387 to include the local school district or the local, excuse me, the local school or district as a reviewer recipient of the application process, which includes education and transitional plans for a student and would establish the school or district as the fiscal steward for the educational needs of the student. This change ensures that the district remains responsible for the complete education needs of each student in the district and that the funding distributed to the school or district through the state education funds follows the students to ensure an equitable educational opportunity 
for every student based on their needs. Existing NRS and NAC language regarding attendance and enrollment, I'm sorry, I'm moving on to the next bigger section of the bill. NRS and NAC language regarding the terms attendance and enrollment was written quite a long time ago and developed for a paper-based system. With the implementation of a statewide student information system eight years ago, these policies were made obsolete. The inconsistent use of terms of attendance and enrollment in NRS and NAC has called, caused a great deal of confusion throughout Nevada school districts. At the request of our partners, the school districts, um, looking at those discrepancies, creating consistency across the language will help us be able to make sure that we can take actionable steps on the information that has provided us. The work group that engaged with, uh, that we had with these conversations around these measures, um, including our Nevada School Performance Framework and chronic absenteeism, we had our department staff, we also had staff of the school districts, as well as um, accountability staff from the school districts. Moving on to the chronic absenteeism, the recommendations of the work group were for formalized, uh, and that hence is put into our bill, AB 54, for those revisions. We look forward to no longer applying the current definitions through the Department of Education and the Nevada 17 school districts. They've been used interchangeably without consideration, and we want to continue to make sure that they are used across the entire system. With that, Madam Chair, we stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation, and I know we will have a few questions. I'm going to start with our star student, Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you again for the presentation and, and again, for the answers uh, that I sent in. There, there are a few, though, that, that can continue to concern me, um, so I just wanted to go over. I, I'm actually going to start from the um, chronic absenteeism, which from the list I had sent you earlier was the last one. So the 10% is basically 18 days, but does that include um, school business? So if there's a student that is a student athlete, would that also be included in that 10% chronic absenteeism or even the religious holidays? So I'm, I'm just still trying to figure out that 10% that as it's being defined on uh, page 23, I believe, of the bill. Thank you, Assemblywoman, for the question. For the record, State Superintendent Joan Ebert. If a student is participating in an athletic event or a school-sponsored event, it is not counted towards chronic absenteeism. They are actually participating in a school-sanctioned uh, piece. Uh, the 10 days is federal, and it is, or excuse me, not 10 days. Uh, the chronic absenteeism, right, the 10%, if you go to school for 180 days, that is 18 days. But if you enroll halfway through the school year, it's not 18 days we're looking at, it's nine, or excuse me, half of that would be nine, correct? Um, so it, it's based on how long the student is enrolled in the school versus um, 18 days. Thank you for that, that clarification, because I think um, there's a reference to the chronic absenteeism, and you mentioned it during your presentation. There's a mention of it on page 24, and then again on page 31, but then it also says, um, in section 28.3, the department shall adopt a regulation. So it feels like it's being mentioned, but then, oh wait, we also still need to adopt that regulation. And I believe there's, you, you mentioned federal regulations, so if you can go into that a little bit more. Thank you, State Superintendent, for the record. Um, so the federal definition is what the state is aligning to. Right now, as we sit here today, that regulation Excuse me, I want to make sure. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, I would like to have Peter Zetz, who oversees that area, um, give you the specific details. Good afternoon, Peter Zutz for the record, Nevada Department of Education, Office of Assessment, Data, and Accountability Management. Um, could you please repeat the question? 
Sure. In, in the most basic sense, what is the current definition that we're using for chronic absenteeism? And um, we're still in the, or it sounds like the department is in the process currently of adopting a definition. So this way it's consistent across all counties, or are we utilizing the federal definition at this time? Thank you, Peter Zutz, for the record. As the superintendent mentioned, we have processed uh, state regulations through to completion. Um, my understanding is that they have received a number with LCB, so we should see them soon. To the first part of your question, the department um, approximately two and a half years ago, through extensive stakeholder engagement with our districts, adopted the federal definition, which you have before you, I believe. The 100 out of 180 days, 10% of the school days, as the superintendent mentioned, whenever a student may enroll, it is 10% of the enrolled school days. Again, exceptions are made for school sanctioned events, such as the example given um, athletic events and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, and I just have my last question. I believe um, it comes from section four, page seven. I just wanna make sure I'm reading um, this correctly, that it's only if a hospital or another facility requests reimbursement, it's not automatically given, and it's only if the student has been enrolled for um, seven days. What is the current process if somebody has in fact been enrolled for, or because again, I think this is regulations that might've been used in the past, but might be a little bit outdated. Interim Deputy Superintendent Dwayne Young for the record. Chair Axrod, if I may go direct to Assemblywoman Natha Anderson. Uh, the current process is actually, <laughs> uh, is actually, they request to the department, they're refunded by the department. And part of this is the inconsistency. I know our larger hospital systems prefer to bill to one single entity because they bill from all of their hospitals to one single entity. But it leaves out the district from understanding when the child was actually receiving service, that ability to, to verify that the education met the standards uh, and align those dates of when the child was turning uh, as we spoke to chronic absenteeism, making sure that those dates aligned and so that it's not. And so in currently in order, they currently notify the department. The department then has to true up with uh, the, the individual districts and then the districts kind of have to chase that information from the hospitals or we have to confirm. This would kind of cut out the middleman as the department and allow them to communicate directly so that we have those inconsistencies worked out. Thank you again. Other questions, members? Assemblywoman Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Assemblywoman Anderson and I are just gonna go back and forth and ask a ton of questions today, I apologize. Um, and, and so my first question is gonna be about um, page eight, 19 of the bill on section 14. Um, I look and I, I see that we're adding a requirement and we're eliminating just the ex expectation that we could approve satisfactory written evidence. And I imagine that was just from like a lack of clarification from the previous legislative cycle. Um, looking at like the history of that language being added, I believe last legislative session, um, but then we're requiring that that written evidence comes from a form of a qualified physician, mental health professional, behavioral health professional. Um, and I, I do have some concerns with that. And I just wonder if a part of that conversation ha uh, has, if there has been any conversation about what, what that means for students in rural areas that have a hard time accessing medical care, what that means for our undocumented students and families that don't access medical care in town, what it means for our families in Southern Nevada that sometimes drive all the way to Mexico to get a doctor, um, so they don't see doctors regularly. And you know, speaking from personal experience, I just know that there's so many children that would fall into this, th this category that aren't going to see a doctor. And so I, I just feel that they're gonna be unfairly targeted in this. And I, I just wanna know, one, has there ha been a conversation about what, what that's gonna mean for those students and families or, or what, ex what other exemptions would be available? Interim Deputy Superintendent Dwayne Young for the record. Um, Assemblywoman Torres, I think, uh, again, as the superintendent said, this is an initial conversation. Um, even now, I'm seeing in my head that because of those rural areas, we may want to add language that looks at uh, advanced practicing registered nurses as well as physician assistants because we know that they often treat in rural areas where we don't have physicians. Uh, but I think uh, the long term, what this language is specifically looking at is when there is a long term condition. And so that would be bump them up to that 10 percent. And so in most of those cases, they have seen some sort of professional, but we are certainly opening to looking at all of the scope of the of the medical professions that we could add to this language. 
Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I would like to work on, uh, on what that might look like for uh, for future because I, I do have some concerns specifically about our undocumented students that don't have access to care in the state of Nevada and don't qualify for Medicaid at all. Um, additionally, I do have some concerns. I apologize for me. Thank you. Um, I do have some concerns um, regarding sections. It's on page 23, section 20. Um, it's looking about uh, it requires the request of a parent or legal guardian of a pupil um, to make a request of like a, a, I guess an absence, three days immediately preceding an emergency. And that just doesn't seem realistic. I don't know three days ahead of time that somebody might pass away. I don't know three days ahead of time that I'm going to have a family emergency or that I might have temporary homelessness. So I think that has to be addressed. Um, I think it should be immediate, like that a parent can put in that request put in that notice essentially to the school um, and that that exemption can be available. Um, so I think that there there's some work um, that can be done. Th thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, the way I'm reading that and maybe I think the rest of the, the paragraph actually does deal with that family emergency, temporary homelessness, right? So Oh, it's saying without limitations. All right, I'm reading that too. So, yeah, I do think, I mean, it, there are many traditions that, that you know, if someone dies, they have to, you know, have a funeral the following day. So, no, I think that we need to be a little more inclusive in this, in this section. So thank you for bringing that up. I read it differently. Thank you. I get back into practice. We have other questions. As, uh, Vice Chair Taylor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you again for the presentation. This is uh, probably more of a follow-up to Assemblywoman Na um, Natha Anderson's question um, regarding the exceptions made um, for absences for that 10% that we're looking for. And, and I know you mentioned, or someone in your team mentioned, Superintendent Ebert, that it's for those school-recognized absences, athletics events, and so on, I think were specifically mentioned that they were, they, there were exceptions. I, I'm wondering what about uh, um, absences that would be for religious purposes, Yom Kippur, Ramadan, something like that. Do, how, how does that fit into that 10% as well? Superintendent Ebert, for the record, currently those are included in the 10%. Okay, so if, if a student, just for, if I may clarify, thank you, Chair. So if a student is absent for religion's reasons, that could count against that number then? Superintendent Ebert, for the record, the um, federal definition and the definition that we've adopted, there's no distinguishing between any type of absence from the classroom. So whether you're out ill, whether you went with your family on vacation, um, the example that you just gave, all of those things are counted as absences. Okay, if, if I may, but there are exceptions because there are athletics events and performances and so on, so those are exceptions then? Excuse me, yes. Um, Superintendent Ebert, for the record, those are school-sanctioned events. School-sanctioned okay. events do not are not included in the 10%. Okay, so that, that is the exception, school-sanctioned events. I, I would just, just to, to state that, I would think we wouldn't want to uh, penalize a student for a religious absence in, in a way. So that's just, we just wanted to say that. So that's a concern I think we want to consider. So thank you. Appreciate thank you, the clarity. Vice Chair, and if I, that is a, a federal regulation, correct? Um, Superintendent Ebert, for the record, the chronic absenteeism that has that we are following and recommending is the federal definition. Correct. So, okay. Gotcha. Um, Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. I was just trying to understand, um, and thank you for the presentation. Really, um, it was short and sweet. Um, but I wanted to understand the free and reduced price lunches. I'm not um, understanding the tracking process um, because I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe some parents um, feel like the data is being collected and used against them. So um, I was wondering if that uh, does that play into uh, this bill here. Superintendent Ebert, for the record, um, what this bill that we're looking at right now and is looking at specifically those students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch, 
and those students that receive free and reduced lunch, that actually partake in the opportunity, they're eligible. So to your question specifically, the, um, it does not address um, uh, parents that may be concerned about the information that they're providing. We're just looking at students that um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. We still want to collect that information um, and uh, relieve the burden of those counting those that are partaking, receiving the free and reduced lunch. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Other questions, members? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And then with that, we will um, open up the testimony and support. Some people approaching. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, uh, my name is Mary Przinsky, representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents, an organization composed of all 17 school district superintendents. And we are here in support of the bill and appreciate the changes that the uh, State Department has uh, brought forward in this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paige Barnes with the Frado Company here today on behalf of the Nevada Association of School Boards. Uh, we are here in, in support of AB 54. Uh, we appreciate that this bill brings clarity and consistency to a number of areas of statute. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we will go to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Vegas in support of AB 54? Not seeing anyone run up to the table. With that, we will go to BPS. BPS, do we have anyone on the line in support? Testify in support of AB 54. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Here it seems we have no callers who want to testify in support of AB 54. Thank you very much, BPS. And with that, we will close testimony in support and move on to opposition. We have any testimony in opposition in, the, in Carson City? Don't see anyone. Anyone in Las Vegas? BPS, anyone on the phones? Testify in opposition on AB 54. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Go ahead, Colin. Hi, my name. Thank you. My name is Darlene Anderson. I'm calling here from Henderson. I was very involved in public education in Sacramento. And as I can see, I'm here. I'm mostly ignored, just ignored. When you put more kids in the classroom and you haven't, as a state, signed a SELPA, that's a special education area plan. None of the districts have them. And we really can't explain what happens for those children when they move to the harbor or the haven. And for the number of children who are dropping out, it's unacceptable that we can't catch them earlier. And so unless the Department of Education is going to come to the table with some real data, I'm going to have a real problem this year watching you people as you just listen to the stories with no data, and it's unacceptable. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Have a blessed day. Okay, thank you for the call. BPS, is there anyone else in opposition of AB 54? We are on opposition to AB 54. If you just recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Chair, it seems we have no more callers in opposition to AB 54. Thank you. And with that, I will close testimony in opposition and move on to neutral. Is there anyone here in Carson City in the neutral position, AB 54? Not seeing anyone. Anyone in Las Vegas? Not seeing anyone. Uh, BBS, anyone on the phones? To give neutral testimony on AB 54, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, neutral testimony for AB 54. If you've just recently joined the call and would like to testify in neutral, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Here it seems we have no callers uh, wanting to testify in neutral. Thank you very much. And uh, Superintendent, I'm, if you had any closing remarks, but I will say that um, I definitely think there's an appetite for members um, to work with you and just to maybe tighten up some things and make some clarifications that I think uh, would benefit this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I very much appreciate the questions and comments um, always for full transparency and conversation is where we should be. Um, with that, I did want to revisit um, chronic absenteeism to be clear on uh, when you think about a child, no matter what the reason is, is missing 18 days in a full school year. That is missing one full day every other week. So two days a month, the child is out of school. I don't know how we can have the learning transpire if they are not in our schools. Um, and so I know when you take off individual reasons and well, what about this one day? Yes, that's why chronic absenteeism is identified as 10%. So I would encourage everybody not to look at just one specific day because we all have reasons why we're not at work or you know, attending certain events, but look at it as in a totality of our expectations that we want to see our children in our schools each and every day. Um, so with that, thank you very much uh, for hearing these two bills. We do look forward to working with you and our constituents all across the state. Thank you very much. And I will close the hearing on AB 54. Now we will move on to our next agenda item, which is public comment. As a reminder, members of the public can provide public comment in person or telephonically and can submit public comment up to 24 hours after the meeting. For those wishing to provide public comment telephonically, instructions for doing so, including the phone number and meeting ID can be found on the agenda for today's meeting, and that agenda is posted in Nellis, N-E-L-I-S. Each person has two minutes to provide testimony. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name for the record. And is there any public comment here in Carson City? You guys all have big Valentine's Day dates, huh? You gonna get out of here? Anything, any uh, public comment in Las Vegas? There's someone in the room. Let's see. They're not. No, you're not. Okay. He's saying no. No. All right. Um, BPS, we will go to the phone lines. Do you have anyone on the line for public comment? To provide public comment, press star nine on your phone now to take your place in the queue. Again, to provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone now to take your place in the queue. Chair, no callers wish to provide public comment at this time. Well, thank you very much, BPS. Um, okay, well, I guess that concludes it. I would like to say happy birthday to my daughter, Molly, who is 16 today. 
the the best Valentine's gift ever, ever, ever. Um, our next meeting will be Thursday, February 16th at 1.30. This concludes our meeting for the day, and our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.